All right, thank you very much. I don't uh, do well with mics here. I usually wander around when I talk, so. Um, trust everyone had a nice meal and is full, so I'll have you to sleep in no time here. Um, thank uh, Applied Thermal for the tours today and the fine meal. We can give them a round of applause as well. Um, Jay had asked me, and, and we had had conversations over the years uh, of, of working with each other in, in different companies of uh, dealing with some heat treating problems and metallurgical problems. Of, and uh, he had asked me to put together just a, a little symposium on some of the, the nuances of choosing proper martensitic and martensitic pH stainless steels and some of the pitfalls of processing and heat treating. So what we'll cover today is, is characteristics of martensitic and martensitic pH stainless steels and how they differ from other stainless steels. Uh, some of the heat treatment principles of both alloys and then I'll do some shameless promotion of TriStar Metals, the company I work for as well. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start you out with a case study and this is actually a true story. I, I have changed the name of the participant to protect the guilty. Um, I, <laughs> I started out at my Monday a couple years ago in my office and I was just kind of minding my own business, going through emails and the phone rang and I saw the caller ID and it was one of those contemplations I'm sure you can all relate to. Do I pick up the phone or not pick up the phone? So I picked up the phone and, and Dave was on the phone and, and we exchanged pleasantries and he uh, started saying, Dan, I've got a problem. I've got a problem with some custom 465 and um, I need your help. I said, okay, well, tell me about your problem. He said, well, I've got a bunch of cracked parts. And uh, what it is is I, I've made some very small components, put them into use. They crack shortly in use. He says, on top of that, when I went to go find replacement parts that we had processed in the same batch, those parts on the shelf who had never, never have seen any application at all were also cracked. I said, okay, well, let's start asking some questions. So I asked him, you know, Dave, what, what kind of condition are you using the custom 465? He says, well, I've, I've heat treated it to H900. I said, okay, and how did you heat treat it to H900? He says, well, we have a vacuum furnace, and I ran it in our vacuum furnace, and um, I said, okay, does your vacuum furnace have a, a backfill quench in it, a purge? Um, no. He said, actually, what I did is I, I put them in at the end of the day, and I just set the uh, furnace to turn off after I left, and, uh, and then I took them out the next morning. So the parts sat and slow cooled in the furnace. And I said, okay. And um, he said, there's something odd, too. The parts came out, and they, they were heat tinted. He said, sometimes we have trouble with heat tint when we age pHs, but they were used to dealing more with 17.4. And he said, but the parts were tinted differently. He says, some in the middle were just a light brown, very little tint, but others were like a gun blue. And I said, okay. And he told me that they just had just a couple dozen parts in. They were very small components. And um, he was puzzled by the different heat tint. And I said, well, what would you do with the heat tint? He says, well, we commonly pickle 17-4, so I had the parts pickled uh, to clean the oxide off. And um, so at the end of the conversation, I had, had a pretty clear idea of what Dave's problem was. Um, but a lot of these things... Uh, happened one at a time, but with Dave they happened all at the same time. And when I conclude the, the presentation, we'll kind of go through these and, and I'll cover some of the issues that Dave dealt with uh, throughout the presentation and, and we'll all be able to answer his questions here before we uh, get done. So, Martin Siddick Stainless Steel Overview. Um, to even step back a little further, stainless steels are really a diverse group of materials. There's, there's well over 300 different types of stainlesses. Uh, they are generally characterized by their crystalline structure. The technical definition is uh, any iron-based alloy that contains over 11.5%, although some people would debate that number, but that's roughly where things become self-passivating. And uh, they are generally selected for their, their combination of strength and corrosion resistance. If you're using stainless, you need, need both those components. They're divided into three main families. Austenitic stainless steels, which are face center cubic alloys. Ferritic stainless steels, which are body center cubic. For purposes of talking about heat treating, those two are the boring families. Um, and there's, there's a, a mix in between. There's a duplex, which actually is a, a group of stainlesses that consist of both austenitic and ferritic at the same time. 
And then there's the Martin Sinek group, and those are the body center tetragonal uh, alloys. And those are the ones that are hardened through heat treating, and the subgroup of Martin Sinek is the Martin Sinek pH alloys. Martin Sinek again is body center tetragonal. Uh, if you're familiar with the old AISI designations, they're the 400 series. Uh, whoever Mr. AISI was confused the world by also denoting the Phoridics as 400 series, so there's no rhyme or reason there, but they are the 400 series uh, alloys. Uh, they are, uh, again, subgroup precipitation hardenable, and they are heat treated to attain the high level of hardness that you can obtain from the alloys. Looking just at the Martin Siddick group, separate of the Martin Siddick pH, they uh, attain high strength after heat treating. They, uh, of, of the stainless materials, have the highest strength capability, but they also have the lowest general corrosion resistance as well. Uh, generally, those two are mutually exclusive properties. Uh, there are some stainless alloys that offer a good combination of both, uh, but they're generally more difficult to work with in other areas. They are uh, ferromagnetic. Uh, but they tend to be magnetically hard as well. And uh, they, they have a moderate work hardening rate. So for those doing cold forming, uh, they do cold form fairly well, not as hard, but as anneal. When you look at typical composition of, of some of the, the uh, representative grades of Martin Siddick, uh, 410, which is really a subgroup of 403, is, uh, is a simple alloy. It's basically a, a, a 10 to 11 carbon material with about 12% chromium um, in the balance iron. So not real complex, but it has a very useful hardness range of uh, roughly 20 to 45 Rockwell C, depending how you temper the material. Type 431 is a little more complex. You can see there's a component of nickel, and it doesn't take a whole lot of alloying additions of, of nickel, molybdenum, or some of the uh, the elements that like the gobble of carbon, like titanium and vanadium, to drastically change the heat treating characteristics of these alloys. Um, but type 431 uses nickel primarily to uh, change the heat treating characteristics as well as add toughness to the material. 420 is a, uh, a little more common grade in medical applications. Again, very simple alloy, a little higher carbon, roughly. Uh, uh, Two to two and a half to three times of what 410 has, with a slight increase in chromium. Again, you can see the hardenability is, is much higher than what 410 would be as a result of the additional carbon. Trimrite, which is a UNS 42010, it's a it's a variation of 420. Uh, it too is is used in medical applications. It is included in F899. Um, it's basically designed to have the hardenability of a 420 but a boost in corrosion resistance that puts it on par with a, uh, a 430 type material. So roughly a, a 70 to 100 hour salt spray alloy. And then the final one is type 440C. It takes you to the, uh, the higher end of the hardness range. You're capable of hardnesses of, of 60 Rockwell. And again, you're, you're just taking the carbon level up, in this case, to, uh, to roughly 1%. In 1%, 440C, quite frankly, is about the limit of what you're going to encounter with a uh, cast rot type material. There is an extension of this family of alloys that go much higher in carbon, but they typically are made uh, through powder processes, and we won't cover those today. To summarize the, uh, the pH stainlesses, uh, the, the the advantageous part of these alloys is they tend to have better corrosion resistance. They're also magnetically hard. They have a moderate work hardening rate, but the more challenging aspect of, of cold working these alloys is the fact that they start at a relatively high strength. Um, and they have moderate to high strength capability, um, and also some size change and distortion attributes with, with heat treatment.